we will go ahead and get started. Um, I thought I would, uh, oh, by all means. Go ahead. I am very pleased to have my granddaughter-in-law with us this morning. Uh, 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 Jenny Corbett, yes. Yes, two of my great-grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Her name is Jenny Corbett. <laughs> Make sure everybody says hello. Welcome to Jenny. Glad you're here. And uh, now, my sister, some of you know my sister. She may sneak in this morning. I am finding out. Um, What's her name? Her name is Nancy. And, uh, well, now, she's Southern. Her name is Nancy Hart. I will call her Nancy Hart, but she does not go by Nancy Hart. She goes by Nancy. Uh, well, that's just weird, you know, your, your entire life saying one thing. And uh, she just said, Dale, I got tired of explaining. No, it's not my last name. It's my, <laughs> I just go by. So, um, Anyway, so uh, she may or may not come. I don't know if she's coming or not. Uh, and then Jennifer is finishing up her uh, her, her twice yearly we trade thing that she does. So Jennifer will be back with us. And who else? Anybody else not here today? It's like a good group today. Um, so we are. Yeah, Hazel and Betty Lou are doing flowers today. Um, and the earth. Is, and I know that. But Bob's been coming on Wednesday nights. Um, we we're doing have to get a bigger room. So uh, by standing room only. So we are, uh, guys. We're on page 15. With, nope, we're not. We're not on page 15. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I got you. Golly, first thing out of my mouth to give you wrong directions. We are on the beginning of lesson two, wherever that is on your book. All right. So y'all just. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, That's okay. It's only once. Yeah. So far. Um, but we are receiving uh, receiving the Spirit. So we're talking about Pentecost. And so I thought what I would do at the beginning this morning after I pray is share a little bit about Pentecost with y'all. I know, you know, it's something we're familiar with, but Pentecost to be such an important part of the life of the church, you know, over two millennia, has not gotten the press of Christmas and Easter and Advent and Lent. And, um, but it's such an important thing. We mentioned last week, I, I talked to you all a little bit about the ascension of Jesus and how that's a big deal. Uh, you know, of course, anything in the life of Jesus is a big deal, as is the life of the Spirit being poured out upon the church. And so we're going to talk about that, what it means, and uh, what kind of... Uh, we weren't present at Pentecost, but we are the recipients of that same Holy Spirit in our lives. And so we'll talk this morning, and perhaps next week we'll see how far we go today um, on that same topic. So let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. Gracious and merciful God, we give you praise and thanks for our time uh, that you provide us each and every week. Lord, help us not to take it for granted. Uh, and this morning, uh, it's so encouraging to see so many folks here, Lord, on a Monday, uh, so many things in their lives going on. I know there's so many things competing with their time, and I'm grateful that you have carved this out for each of us. And we pray that your Holy <coughs> Spirit, the Spirit that we'll be talking about this morning, will be present among us this morning, leading us, guiding us, illuminating our minds, speaking through us and giving us eyes to see and ears to hear of all the precious truths that we find in Scripture. So, Lord, we are grateful for this time, and help us to use it well and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, uh, you'll want to turn to Acts 2, as well as the very first page of lesson 2. Page 10. And, uh, yes, page 10, as I was just saying. Um, and uh, so what we're going to do, it's divided up, interestingly, it's divided up into Pentecost proper, which will be the day of and the Holy Spirit comes to Pentecost, and then we're going to get the sermon of Peter, which is one of the great sermons in the book of Acts, uh, and then just, what, five or six short little verses from 42 to 47 that really outline the method of the church 
in many ways for 2,000 years after, but certainly in the early church, when, for example, when it says the people came and sat at the feet of the apostles, well, now they've been dead for a couple thousand years, so when we sit at the feet of the apostles, what are we doing? We're reading the Bible. We're doing what we're doing now. Because what we have in Holy Scripture, in the New Testament in particular, we have the prophets and we have the, the apostles. When we read the New Testament, we are sitting at the feet of the apostles. Um, even if it wasn't directly written by an apostle, it, it was always written by an associate <coughs> excuse me, of the apostles. And so it was under their authority. So when you read something like, well, Acts, we talked about this. Luke was not one of the apostles, but who did he travel around with? Um. Paul. Uh, yeah, he was with Paul. He may have seen Jesus. Um, but uh, anyway, so we have you know, the, the authority of Paul behind Luke. We have the authority of Peter behind the Gospel of Mark and, and so on. So that, that's sort of the, the way it works. And, and here's one of the key ideas. When you're studying this historically, like from a historical perspective, uh, one of the things that New Testament scholars will look for is how were these letters received by the early church? And by the early church, we mean first century church. Were they received as authoritative writings from an apostle or apostolic authority, or were they just, you know, Joe Schmo decided to write a letter? and Because there were a lot of that kind of thing as well. And they would receive these writings, and sometimes they're called Gnostic writings, and they're false teachings. Uh, there's a Gnostic Gospel of Thomas that maybe you've heard about, and I wouldn't, don't waste a, don't waste a second reading it. It's, it's, it's false teaching, and the early church knew these things, so it's, it's good for us to go back and say, uh, what were the early writings that the early church received as authoritative, and that's one of the ways in which they did that. So, Anyway, that, that's, our, that's our topic today. Let me read that opening paragraph on page 10. Um, and uh, I'll read this, and then I want to read a couple things just about Pentecost. And again, this may be something you're very familiar with, but there might be some folks in here that aren't quite as familiar, and maybe it'll be helpful to hear it again. So, without the Holy Spirit, Christian discipleship would be inconceivable, even impossible. Will everybody say amen? Amen. All right. Without the Holy Spirit, Christian discipleship would be inconceivable, even impossible. There can be no life without the life giver, no understanding without the spirit of truth, no fellowship without the unity of the spirit, no Christ-likeness of character apart from his fruit, and no effective witness without his power. I mean, that is refrigerator magnet worthy. Just writing all that down. And so, um, it says, as a body without breath, uh, as a body without breath is a corpse, so the church without the spirit is dead. Luke is well aware of this and emphasizes the power of the spirit throughout Acts, especially Acts 2, which is all about the day of Pentecost when the spirit comes. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read a couple things. You don't have this in front of you, but I just want to, I want to share it. Um, and I will, I won't read nearly as much as I might be tempted to do, but I, I just thought this would be helpful. First of all, Pentecost was already a thing, all right, before the New Testament. It was one of the major Jewish feasts. It was the Feast of Weeks. And how many weeks did it represent? And the hint is in the penta of penta, 50 in this case. So it was or, uh, 50 days, five weeks, uh, 50 days after Passover. Um, so that's why it's celebrated. So they had Passover. Who died at Passover? Uh, not in the New Testament. Jesus. Jesus, yeah. So this is 50 days after his life, you know, or his death and resurrection and all of that. So... 50 days, basically, after Passover, and it celebrates the end of the grain harvest. So this was something that Jews would have been very familiar with. Um, and so it says the Pentecost that followed Jesus' death and resurrection was the occasion on which the Holy Spirit was given to believers in Jerusalem. 
So that just gives you a little background on that. Um, then I want to read about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we'll, talk, we'll be talking about this all throughout. But the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is one of the gifts of salvation by which God's very presence and the person of the Spirit indwells the church corporately and Christians individually, drawing them into the life of the, tri the triune God, which means God as Trinity, God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, I'm going to read this one paragraph, and then we'll, we'll jump back into our lesson. But it says, as Jesus prepared his disciples for his departure from earth, this is what we talked about the last couple weeks, he reassured them with the promise that the Father would send the Holy Spirit to be with them. Listen to this. This is what we can still count on today. To be with them and within them. Okay, so the Spirit lives within us. Through the Spirit's indwelling, the Father and the Son would also make, uh, quote unquote, make our home within them. John 14, 23. So that's a promise that as the Spirit dwells within us, so do the Father and the Son. So God indwells us through the Spirit. Um, but we have the Godhead living within us, and that's why we can have comfort and peace and encouragement and joy and live lives of gratitude because of that great gift. So it says the greatest gift Christ could offer was not just the promise of spiritual gifts or spiritual fruit, as great as those are, but the promise of the very person of the Spirit within them. This promise was demonstrably fulfilled at Pentecost when the Spirit publicly fell upon God's people and supernaturally endowed the proclamation of the gospel to the nations, which is what we're going to be talking about because we're going to see some things that were, well, that's not what you normally see. Yeah, that's not normally what you experience, but it was a powerful outpouring. So let's get things going to hear from you guys. I have a question for us. Yes, please. Uh, under, in the second paragraph under study, it said Pentecost was the inauguration of the new era of the Spirit. I, I'd like to hear your expounding on that. Okay, <laughs> my exposition on that. Uh, so, and y'all heard me say this before, so as soon as I say it, you're going to say, I've heard you say that. Uh, I'm sure you took extensive notes on that day, and uh, it was, it was life-changing. Um, so in the Old Testament... The Holy Spirit didn't just all of a sudden come into being in the New Testament, right? We all know that. Uh, remember what it says in Genesis 1? What hovered over the waters at creation? The Spirit. The Spirit. Or I could say who hovered over. Uh, the Spirit. And then we see throughout different times, throughout the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, where the Spirit... Uh, someone is anointed with the Spirit or filled with the Spirit. David is filled with the Spirit. Even Saul, at a particular moment, was filled with the Spirit. And you see that uh, when a prophet uh, starts speaking in the name of God and you know, gives us a thus saith the Lord. It is the Spirit working through them. And so I heard this formulation 20 plus years ago and it has always stayed with me. And here's the difference between the Old Covenant, uh, the Spirit's presence in the Old Testament or Old Covenant versus the New. In the Old Testament or Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit was given to particular people at particular times at, for particular purposes. Particular people, particular times, particular purposes. Whereas here, the Holy Spirit is being poured out on everybody. everybody. Yeah, so... Uh, that's going to be the significant difference between the two. And it's because basically Christ had to come first and become the mediator by which we could enter into that relationship. The Spirit does a work of regenerating our hearts and drawing us by His provenient grace and drawing us into that relationship and fills us with His Spirit and gives gifts to the church. So, the whole, uh, there are, you know, there's still... Uh, not particular purposes, but people have particular gifts. So not everybody in here has the same spiritual gift, right? Right. Um, now, here's one thing, and I don't want to get, this might send us down the, the path, you know, the path from which we never come back. Um, but while we all have 
uh, the same Holy Spirit who gives us gifts, we have different gifts, but when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, we are all called to uh, pursue all the gifts of the Spirit. So you cannot say, you know, think about... Unknown caller. <laughs> there's a... You're, you're quick on the draw there. Um, there, you know, there are more than just these get uh, these fruit of the spirit that Paul lists in Galatians five. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and all that. Sorry, but I don't have a no phone Christian. Phone no Christian ought to ever say, "Well, I don't have the spiritual gift of love, so I'm not going to show it." Or, well, I don't have the spiritual gift of patience, and therefore I don't need to worry about it. No, much like, much like the Beatitudes that we find in Matthew 5, where Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those are meant to be a composite portrait of what every Christian ought to look like. So, now you may say to yourself, well, I am lacking in patience, but all that should tell you is, I need to start praying for that. Mm -hmm. Now, don't pray, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. <laughs> All right? Because um, let me tell you what, this is the way God gives spiritual gifts. If you pray for patience, he gives you the opportunity to exercise patience. <laughs> All right? So this is not take two Bible verses and call me in the morning. All right? This is not put a Bible under your pillow and you'll wake up with patience the next morning. This is, if you're praying for patience, God says, all right, you asked for it, here it goes. And God will bring those special people in your life um, who will give you the opportunity to put into practice love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. So, um, but, but now remember, before you start saying, oh, they're my special person for patience, ask yourself, I wonder if I am somebody special person for patience. Right. Uh, all right. That street goes both ways. So uh, you may have those people in your life, but you may be one of those people in somebody else's life. So that anyway, that's the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. There are some things, like we did not have the, the promised Messiah in the old covenant, and then the present Messiah, the one who was promised, who came and fulfilled. All that was prophesied and foretold in the Old Covenant. Well, so we're going to learn this today from Joel. The pouring of the Spirit was also prophesied in the Old, in the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. And remember, the word testament just means covenant. So you can go back and forth. I say, we say Old Testament because we're just sort of used to talking that way. Um, anyway, so here's the question to get the ball rolling this morning. Um, what difference do you think it would make if the Holy Spirit were, were withdrawn from your life and your Christian community? Who wants to share? Bill. You'd be lost forever. Lost forever. Why is that? Well, I don't you disagree. You <laughs> don't have the Spirit. Okay. Which means if you don't have the Spirit, you're not accepting the Spirit. And if you don't expect the Spirit, you're not accepting our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. All right. So you are lost forever because of that. All right. Yeah, you're in a world of trouble That's right. uh, without the Holy Spirit. In, you're in deep kimchi. <laughs> Someone down there say something, John? Yeah, I just said total turmoil and chaos. Okay. Turmoil, chaos. You have no teacher. You have no teacher. Yeah, yeah. What, what did we just say about the Holy Spirit? What else are we lacking if we lack the Spirit? The fruits. Well, if we won't have the fruit of the Spirit, we, we'll lack the presence of God in our lives. Um, you know, I wanted to read something, so I'm going to see if I can find this here. Um, listen to this. This is King David in Psalm 51. You don't have to turn there, but if you want to write down Psalm 51, as uh, Pastor Philip alluded to it yesterday, I want to read verses 10 and, um, well, 10, 11, and 12. So this is David. This is his great psalm of repentance after Bathsheba and the big mess he made and that whole thing. Uh, he really, this is why he's still called a man after God's own heart, because he didn't just say, eh, you know, moved on. He, it, it, it wrecked him, and so he really just is crying out during this time. 
But listen to this. He says, create a pure heart in me, O God, and renew a steadfast renew a steadfast spirit. Now that's lowercase s there. So a, a steadfast spirit within me that I will, I will be renewed, that I'll be steadfast in my spirit. But then he says this. Verse 11. This is the goosebump verse. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Okay? Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. But that verse 11, do not cast from me your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. And so David at least understood I can't I can't be the man, I can't be the king of Israel, and I can't even be the man of God that you call me to be apart from that renewed spirit and your spirit living in me and living through me. And I want to suggest we cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ in any significant measure, or any measure. We can go through the motions and we can say the right things, but we can't... You remember uh, in John 15... Uh, Jesus says, you, you, you all know, you can all fill in the blank here. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. All right? So if we are abiding in Christ in his words, and he and his words are abiding in us, he said, you know, ask whatever you want. You'll do great things. You know, you'll bear much good and lasting fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, that's the same principle here. We can't do anything of kingdom significance apart from the Holy Spirit. We cannot do anything as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ apart from the Holy Spirit. We can still, you know, we can still do earthly things, you know, and go back and forth to work and, uh, you know, all the different activities of a day, but we can't do anything meaningful for the kingdom of God. And so... Uh, you know, this is what I put is that, you know, I would start thinking, speaking, and living like the world without the Holy Spirit. I would hold the same attitudes and motivations and values. I would I would turn on Christ and rebel against him immediately if I did not have the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because when I already start drifting in a direction that I, I shouldn't be because I'm drifting and not being intentional. Who is it that convicts you of your sin? He does. It's the Holy Spirit. And that's why we, the Holy Spirit, every now and then may give us a little slack. <laughs> but how many times have you, uh, you've said something you know you shouldn't have said, you thought something you know you shouldn't have thought, done what you shouldn't have done, and maybe even in the midst of it, you start feeling the conviction of the Spirit. Yeah. And so that is, that's, and of course, therefore, the church would crumble. Because the church corporate cannot do anything apart from the Holy Spirit. Neither can we individually. So that's, that's, why, that's why when you say something that you shouldn't have said immediately, you're like, you want to take it back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah and, yeah, and so, and on that note, I would say that if you are, um, I mean, if you're just going your own way, there, it does, the scripture does, and we won't talk about this this morning, but it does talk about sort of, uh, you can sear your conscience, and you can grieve the Holy Spirit, and for, so here's what that would look like, if you sin, and you feel that conviction, and you just ignore it, keep on doing it, feel the conviction, ignore it. At some point, God may say, just because God disciplines those he loves, okay, have thine own way. You know, no one wants to, we do not want to hear those words from our Lord, have thine own way. We want to say to him, have thine own way. Um, but we, we don't want to be the ones saying that. So, top of page 11. I'm guessing. <laughs> Now, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go through this right over right now. Um, so it says, uh, Pentecost brought to the apostles what they needed for their special role. Remember, we're all disciples, but there's a sense in which apostles, we mentioned this last week, they have a different role. They are foundation. They are the pillars of the early church, and they're going to be the, the 
this is not a real word, but this is my word. They are the passer honors. <laughs> they are passing on the truths of Jesus. Jesus said that the Spirit will bring to mind what I have taught you. And so when they're writing the New Testament, when they're writing these things, when they are teaching the early church and everyone is sitting at their feet, they're not just saying, you know, you're not, they're not scratching their heads saying, what did he say there? Um, no, they're not doing that. They, it, the Holy Spirit is bringing that to their mind. So uh, he promised them and he reminded uh, about the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. Second paragraph, Pentecost was the inauguration of the new era of the Spirit. That's what Katie was just talking about. Although his coming was a unique and unrepeatable historical event, all the people of God can now always and everywhere benefit from his ministry. So now, every time someone new comes to faith in Jesus Christ, it is because there has been a work of the Spirit drawing them uh, to himself, uh, and they have the, you know, every person in this room, if you are a new creature in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, and you have at least one gift. You may have more, but you have at least one gift of the Spirit. Uh, sometimes we scratch our heads and say, well, I don't know what that is, or I don't know how to put it into practice. And that's where you can join with other Christians and discover them and learn how to put them into practice and how you can grow in them. And then when you've been faithful with what you've been given, I think we can even ask for more. Lord, give me more. Give me more of you. I want to serve you um, more widely or in greater depth or whatever. But here's, I think, a, a, certainly a principle that Jesus teaches. Don't ask for more until you have used what you've already been given. Amen. All right? Don't start saying, I want more. I want more. Um, because, uh, you know, think about the parable of the talents. The guy who went and hid his in the backyard. Well, he wasn't faithful with one. Okay? So I hope he wasn't holding out. Maybe I'll get two this go round, or I'll get five, or something like that. So, anyway, same sort of principle behind that. All right. So, uh, let's read this uh, Acts 2, 1 through 13. And, uh, <laughs> would you mind uh, reading that for us? One through, uh, 1 through 13. Thank you. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there was a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, and because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each, amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who were speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Oh, good gravy. <laughs> Parthians, Medes, okay, all those people. Um, <laughs> Where's Wesley? Where's Wesley, yes. Okay, <laughs> and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. Yes, which is a uh, uh, not-so-subtle way of saying they're drunk. Um, yes, uh, I do apologize for uh, that. Uh, I didn't give it to you because I can't pronounce them. Uh, 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 Just wanted to see me louder. Oh, not at all. Um, I just, <laughs> I actually gave you the short one because like the next one's 14 through 41. I'm like, oh god, and then I saw that. I said, oh goodness. Um, all right, well, we'll pronounce them in a minute. Uh, the idea is they're from all over. All right. <laughs> so um, then, uh, so question one uh, there is: Describe in detail, as if you were a reporter covering an important story, what happened on the day of Pentecost. So, what would make your story? What would be the highlights that you would want your readers to know? Well, I'm just like scared. No other wind in the world. Came yes. From heaven. Okay. And tongues of fire. All right. Came down. 
and then dwell into the chosen ones. Okay. Yeah, what were you going to say? Well, pretty much the same thing as Bill. Well, really, if that wind came into your room, you know, in a secure place, but not only that, the flickers of flames were able to come down with that wind. Yeah. You know, in spite of that wind. Yeah. I mean, I mean uh, well, that would be... God's got a way with fire, doesn't he? Uh, <laughs> you got burning, burning bushes that don't consume the bush. You got, but they appeared as flames of uh, fire. So, um, but yeah, so that was pretty astonishing. Um, Just the fact that there were so many that gathered that spoke different languages. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. pretty amazing. Isn't that amazing? amazing? So, yeah, if you're a reporter covering that, you're saying, <clears throat> you are saying this. <laughs> you are saying Parthians, Medes, Elamites, <laughs> Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene. Go ahead and smack him. They were there too. <laughs> <laughs> was she calling for violence? Let's pray for her. Right. Uh, so, yeah, no, they were from the Roman Empire. And they were gathered because all the Jews had come for Passover. Uh, and that was not just like a day trip. <laughs> okay. okay. They had come from a long way off. They had been there. And uh, so, and where, and where was this taking place? In the Jerusalem. I mean, so, I don't want to, I don't want to, I mean, it was just the, the, the central place that a Jew would be during this time if they were able to be there. Now, now, some people that lived on the farthest reaches of the Roman Empire, they couldn't make it for these things. But if you lived anywhere, you know, within a several days' walk or even a week's walk, you, you went to this. But when you went, you stayed. And, yeah, I mean, this was not... And uh, the other thing about it is, besides the fact that in this case Christ died, what else was killed during this time of Passover? All these lambs, and everything. I mean, it was there was carnage. I mean, it was a it was a lot of animals dying, a lot of blood, a lot of you know things were being atoned for. They were remembering the Passover. Remember, I know I, we studied this a couple years ago now, but Passover marks that time when the angel of death came over when the people of Israel were in captivity to Egypt, and they had to put the blood on the door and all that. And that's why I love. I love the fact that uh, Jewish holidays today are always very close in proximity to ours. Uh, because it just shows you uh, the harmony and connection between the two, even if um, you know, we would want, you know, we'd want to nudge them a little bit <laughs> farther. Um, but I think it's, it's very special, and that's, that's evidenced here. Um, that um, they're so close together. So, yeah, so all these people, they're assembled in a room, and also this great storm with, like you're talking about, Bill, the, the flames, the tongues of uh, fire, the flames, the, the wind, all this swirling around, and they began speaking, and it, 